Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To reduce risk in your life, go to myworstinvestmentever.com today and take the risk reduction assessment I created from the lessons I've learned from more than 500 guests. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, John Spence. John, are you ready to join our mission? I'm on the team, my friend. I'm on the team. I'm excited to have you. Well, let me introduce you to the audience. John Spence is an author, international executive coach, professional development educator, virtual trainer, strategic planning facilitator, keynote speaker, and developer of online learning programs. John is recognized as one of the top business thought leaders and leadership development experts in the world and was named by the American Management Association as one of America's top 50 leaders to watch, along with uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page of Google and Jeff Bezos of, Amazon's, of Amazon. As a consultant and coach to organizations worldwide, from startups to Fortune 10 companies, John is dedicated to helping people and businesses be more successful by, this is interesting, ladies and gentlemen, making the very complex awesomely simple. John, take a minute and tell us about the value that you bring to this beautiful world. Well, you, you just hit on a little bit. I, I have a, uh, I, get, I was teaching this the other day to a class about look for your zone of genius. Uh, mine is in finding patterns. Uh, I, I, I've worked with companies all over the world. I read about 100 to 120 business books a year, and I have every year for almost 30 years. And my value is I'm able to take lots and lots and lots of information and experience and boil it down to understandable ideas that people can take action on. And, you know, that's fascinating because you'd think people should be good at that. But in fact, what you find is that it's just the opposite. People are good at complexity. Mm -hmm. So can you just um, explain a little bit about your observations um, from your years of experience? Um, you know, why are people constantly moving towards complexity? Why is simplicity hard? And if people aren't doing simplicity, they're doing complexity, why is complexity wrong? Compl well, first of all, complexity uh, infers intelligence. <laughs> if I can talk about things in a very complex way and it's, it's hard for you to understand, then obviously I much be smarter than you are because I understand these complex things. And I'm, I'm making a little bit of fun of it there. But complexity is easy because you don't have to think about it, which sounds counterintuitive. But simplicity is taking away everything that isn't relevant. Um, being able to wade through the complexity and figure out only the most essential ideas. It actually takes a tremendous amount more effort and work to be able to peel away the layers and find the, the essence of something, as I, as I like to say, the pattern or the thread that runs through everything and be able to identify that and explain that rather than being caught in the giant you know, ball, the mess of complex that looks intelligent. Um, so if you talk about complexity, you just mentioned something. I wrote down a word, bluffing. You know, there's plenty of people that are out there kind of bluffing and they're talking about complex things and making it difficult because they don't really understand it. But of course, that's not everyone. Some no. people kind of hide behind that. But there's mm -hmm. other people that are operating in complexity for other reasons, such as, you know, if I look at, if I look at my own business, uh, let's just say in, in a factory that I've got here in Bangkok with my friend, a coffee factory, we've had it for 28 years. It's just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of ideas that have been implemented without ideas being extinguished, you know, clearly extinguished. And so you just build this layer upon layer of complexity. And I'm just curious, like, how is it? I mean, we know this complexity exists in most businesses. How is it that big businesses survive with all this complexity? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I can speak to big businesses. I've worked in companies all the way up to the Fortune 10. They are sort, in my opinion, uh, sort of uh, successful in spite of the complexity. Uh, there, that maybe at the heart of it is there are some people that can see through and see the pattern. 
but for the most part, I, this is my opinion on very large companies, is they have enough money that they can throw problems at complex ideas. If they spend a couple million or a couple hundred million chasing something and realize it wasn't the direction they needed to go, it's not going to completely wipe them out where smaller organizations don't have the luxury of throwing money at problems like that. And, you know, Andrew, really the key of it here is having the discipline to say no. When things start to layer and layer and layer and get more and more complex, someone has to have the courage to walk in and say, we're not doing that anymore. We're not investing in that. This isn't a good time of our good use of our limited resources of time, money, and people. We have to be able to walk away from it. And I see a lot of organizations, especially larger organizations, that have legacy things that run on for years and years and years. And because of the sunk costs, they don't want to walk away from it. So it just keeps adding layer and layer of complexity. Mm. And one of the things I've always said to uh, people is that a small business should not fear a large business because if you can keep focused in one area and keep it simple in that area, you can easily beat a, a big company in that area. They have the advantage of the brand or the money, yes, but you have the advantage of keeping it simple and serving a specific need. And so um, maybe you could just give us some um, ideas from your own experience over the years. Like what are some tips or what are some thoughts that you could share with us, uh, you know, about what you've learned? Well, it, it, it's interesting. You've, you've hit on a point here, a little bit of a TED talk I did on the future of leadership. And I talked about the three quotients, if you will, that it's going to be necessary to be successful as a leader in the future. IQ, EQ, and AQ. Uh, your IQ is not the number. It's not being Einstein. It's your competence level. Uh, are you good at what you do? Uh, EQ is obviously your emotional quotient. Do you get along well with other people? If you're brilliant and you can't, can't get along well with other people, you aren't a leader and you probably don't run a business very long unless it's sitting in a basement, uh, you know, coding things that you never have to deal. But the last one, the AQ is the one you, we've touched on right now, which is your adaptability question. My wife is actually the one that introduced this to me. She heard it on a Wharton Business Channel uh, podcast. And it's about adaptability and agility. And when we look at the things we're talking about right now, there's a couple elements to that. And two of the most interesting to me are one is an insatiable curiosity, constantly wanting to le uh, learn, read, study, find out more and more and more. But also, you'll love this one, Andrew, is the ability to unlearn things quickly, to figure out what isn't working anymore, what doesn't add value, what the customer doesn't want. And from a small business standpoint, typically you're much, much, much closer to the customer and you have the ability to be more adaptable and agile at a much faster pace. Mm. And I guess you don't even have the resources to do complex things or try to try to hit on many points with a particular product or service. Um, one of the questions I have, you know, I tell you a story about my father went to Cornell to study uh, chemistry and he, he had a professor there that, you know, that he talked about that, uh, later went to Cal, Cal Tech, and that was a guy named Richard Feynman. And <laughs> Richard Feynman was, uh, you know, amazing. So my dad introduced me to Richard Feynman. My dad's passed away, but he, uh, he introduced me to that. And so I have books by Richard Feynman. I've watched a lot of his videos, and he's a remarkable man because he would start teaching by telling an example of something quite simple that, that we have saw in everyday life and then building on that example into, into a very complex theory. And, you know, I've learned a lot in my teaching, and I think that's what I've tried to do is take complex financial matters and figure out how to build them up block by block. And I'm just wondering, you know, he, I, I would say that, that uh, Feynman is, a, is a, uh, someone to look to as an example mm -hmm. of simplicity. I mean, if he can make things simple, you know, we have no excuse. And I'm just wondering, besides Feynman, and, you know, he's already an amazing example, who are some other either people or companies that, that we should look to or in, that, that could inspire us to, to build more simplicity into our businesses and into our lives? So, actually, Richard Feynman is a hero of mine. Uh, if you were to look, this is one of my libraries. We'll have my shoulder, Seven Easy Pieces and all of his... All of his yep. books are up there. Um, I know little to nothing about quantum physics, 
but I've enjoyed reading Feynman because he does make an incredibly complex topic more approachable. Not, I won't say easy. <laughs> Quantum physics is never really easy, but it, he does make it more approachable. I think the, the absolutely the best example I could use, and it's a one that's probably a little overused, is Apple. Um, you know, John Ivey that designed these things. I, I'll give you an example. It's my favorite one is Apple's come with no instructions. <laughs> I can buy a, you know, a $5,000 laptop, which is, I don't know, I'm on my wife's laptop right now. It's a super high-end Mac. Uh, there's not a page of instructions. I just got a brand new iPhone. You open it up, it's just like, figure it out. It, because they made it so simple and so intuitive. And if you ask John Ivey, who's the designer of Apple, who's obviously, their products are beautiful and sleek and uh, incredibly approachable, all those things. He said, you just keep taking away everything until you get to only the things that are important. The fact that you can open up an exceedingly complicated, very sophisticated piece of technology, more technology than uh, existed on the face of the earth in the year I was born, 1964. You can, hang on, you can hold it in your hand and it doesn't need an instruction manual. That is, to me, one of the most profound examples of simplicity. That's a great way to think about it. You know, for everybody out there, how do we come up with products and services that are so clear and so simple that they don't need uh, instruction manuals? That's a great way to think about it. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, Tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it, and then tell us your story. So, interesting story. I became um, the CEO of one of the Rockefeller Foundations when I was 26 years old. Uh, I had uh, offices and projects running in 20 countries around the world. Uh, at that age, I, I didn't understand what I didn't understand, and I still don't understand what I don't understand, but I knew even less then. Uh, and a, a little bit, not even a little bit, a, a fair amount of hubris led me to investing in houses, houses and boats and property and artwork and wine collections and things that were the trappings of being the CEO of a multinational company at a young age. Uh, I thought that those were the things that would impress other people, uh, that I had a beautiful house on the beach in Miami and I had a nice boat and a, you know, a house in the Keys with my family and all these things, or the Florida Keys. Uh, and that turned out after the story, I will tell you, to change in my mind pretty dramatically. So in, in August of 1989, uh, a long time ago, I was traveling out of the country and Hurricane Andrew started heading towards Miami, Florida. And I, I made it back just in time to grab uh, a cooler of food uh, and one of those big water cooler bottles of water from my office. This is back in the old days. I had all the hard drives and all the discs in a backpack from the company and a little bit of food. And I jumped in my truck. I had a SUV truck and uh, evacuated about 14 miles inland. At three o'clock in the morning, the house that I evacuated to with my friends uh, the roof came off of. There was 11 of us jammed in the bathroom. And I'll never forget looking at the lock in the bathroom with water shooting through it, straight through it like a squirt gun and water sloshing out of the toilets against the walls of the room, which is when I realized the entire house was getting ready to get sucked off the foundation and be gone. Um, woke up the next morning, obviously we survived it. It looked like someone had taken machine guns to, the, to everything in sight. Uh, drove back to try to find my house. My house was basically gone. It took us seven hours with a chainsaw to try to cut our way back to where my front door used to be. Uh, I ended up having to live in my truck for two and a half months. Uh, and then I lived in an abandoned apartment with a huge hole in the top with fiberglass and cockroaches and, you know, taking cold showers and eat, living on a little mattress and with a light and eating out of that. Um, trying to take care of the people that work for me, because that was the most important thing to me, is make sure all the folks that I have are well taken care of. Uh, and it was an interesting thing that I invested so much time, energy, effort, ego, um, personal, uh, I'm trying to, personal ego, I guess would be the right word to say, and investing in all that stuff. 
And all of that stuff was taken away from me in one, one day. Mm -hmm. Everything I'd collected, all my pictures, artwork, wine, blah, 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 boat, house, everything disappeared. And luckily I had lots of insurance, which is great, but it was an incredible lesson for me to learn that it was just stuff. That my family was healthy, my wife was okay, none of my friends got hurt or killed. It was incredibly, and it also taught me another lesson is, you can put your head down and get through stuff. You can suffer a pretty significant loss, but if you just stay focused on your values and understanding that there's other people that have been through things as bad or worse, uh, and for me, at least in the hurricane, everybody was going through what I went through, and I was lucky that I had insurance and, and money in the bank. But today, fast forward, I, I have a nice home and a nice office and a beautiful yard and all that. But if my wife called me tomorrow and said the house burned down to the ground, as long as my two dogs and my wife were fine, it literally would have zero impact on me whatsoever. I'm just like, hey, we'll go to a hotel room. It'll be fine. We'll rebuild everything. So I guess to, to Andrew, I guess it was the investment of ego in stuff that was my worst investment ever. And it was an incredibly brutal, if you will, lesson of when all that stuff was taken away that has now made me understand that those things are wonderful and I like them. I mean, I, I love the nice stuff I have, but it doesn't define me and it doesn't define my life and it's nice, but it's not really that important. And life will go on if you are focused and you have people on your team to help you and you have good people around you and you have, you have clear values about what's most important to you. Wow. <clears throat> Well, I think you have discussed, you know, what you've learned, but let's just recap it. If you were to summarize what you learned, what would you say is lesson one, two, three? Lesson one is it's just stuff. Yep. Lesson two is you're much stronger than you think you are. And lesson three is be grateful for everything you have now. Hmm. Um, and thank you for asking that question. No one's ever asked that. I don't tell this story very often. This is a, not something I talk about, not that I'm embarrassed, but it's just not a topic that comes up often. And the sure. question you just asked me was very insightful for me as well. Yeah, it's, it's great to recap and think about it. Um, maybe I'll share a few things that I, I've been, you know, writing down some stuff here as I've been listening <laughs> to you talk. Um, I think the, the big takeaway from this for the listeners and for myself is it's just stuff. And that, that's a great, um, and in fact, that could be the title of this um, episode. But what <laughs> I also wrote down was when you lose your stuff, it uncovers your values. And you, re, you, know, you said, okay, these are my values. But sometimes when, we have, when, 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 we're, when we're covered up in stuff, we detach or lose contact with our values. So sometimes losing stuff forces you to re- Refocus on your values. Um, the third thing I, I wrote down is uh, zero impact if I lost everything. And, okay, that's freedom. Yeah. That's ultimate freedom. And I, I always say that, you know, there's the ultimate freedom is the freedom of your mind, mm -hmm. the freedom to think, the freedom to detach. And maybe I'll just share a story of my own uh, situation. I was in somewhat of a similar situation, but I arrived there with no stuff. <laughs> I didn't accumulate stuff and then lo lose it. I just arrived at a point with no stuff. Basically, I was 16 and going into serious trouble with alcohol and drugs in high school. And uh, so you were born in 64. I was born in 65. And... Um, I went into a really, really difficult time in high school and tried to kill myself. I was dealing drugs. I was getting in serious trouble with my parents. They ended up putting me into three different rehabs, and eventually the third one took, and it, it worked. And it was a seven-month rehab where I was forced to reboot myself, basically. I didn't have anything to worry about except how do I change the way I think, feel, react, and all that. And it was a 12-step program. And, you know, since that time now, as of in September of this year, it will be 40 years that I haven't taken alcohol or taken any drugs. So it worked. Thank you. It, it worked. But what I recall is graduating from that uh, rehab 
and then going out on my own. My, I was 17, just about to turn 18. My parents had asked me to go out and you know, make your own. We don't want to go through you know, your struggles again. And so I went out on my own, and I had no money. I, I had a little moped that I rode, and I rode it to a factory about an hour away, and I worked on a factory production line and make it $3.35 an hour and, you know, riding that bike, that, that moped back home. And, and, but what I had was I had the friendships I had made from the rehab, plus the friends that I had that were getting clean and sober at the time, which was some of my best friends. We were all kind of doing it at the same time. We went to 12-step meetings and things like that, and after meetings went out for dinner and talked. And what I can remember, and even I remember going to the church to occasionally get bags of like canned foods. I even had food stamps for a period of time. Um, it was just, I had nothing. Mm -hmm. I lived in a, a room inside a boarding house at Kent State, outside of Kent State in, in the city of Kent, Ohio. And I had nothing. But, you know, I was happy. Every day I was happy. I was having a good time at work. I made friends. At night I looked forward to being with my friends. I was clean and sober. It had been lifted from me, the obsession that I had. And I was just very happy. And so as I've gone through life, I've had accumulations of wealth and I've had destructions of wealth and accumulations mm -hmm. of wealth and destructions of wealth. And what I can say after being through those cycles is that I can always look back at that time and say, I had nothing and I was still happy. Therefore, the accumulation of things is, I would just say, uncorrelated to happiness. You know, it's, uh, it's, just, it's neutral. Yeah. And so, you know, you got there by accumulating and then losing and then building that awareness. I got there just by, you know, never really accumulating, but it prepared me for future losses. When I saw that we were going to potentially lose our coffee business, that I lost my job, the Asian crisis in 1997, everything was collapsing. But what I knew in my core is I'm going to make it through this. And that is my, you know, takeaway. You bring me back to that. And I think it's a, such an important lesson for the listeners out there is that it's just stuff. Anything you'd add to that? Yeah, there, there's three things. Um, first of all, you know, you and I have had a discussion about issues we've been through. One of the things I've learned through my, that everybody's been through some sort of hell, pain, loss. Uh, and, and, and that doesn't stop us. We move forward. We've all had challenges, but we still have the ability to be very, very successful. Key here by whatever de definition of success you choose. Um, again, I like stuff a lot and I have some, but my definition is not around stuff. It's around, do I live my values every day? And am I living a life that's close to the life I've dreamed of? Uh, so that's one thing is that we all have baggage and I, as now I'm 58, just turned 58, I've really learned that at a deep level. Number two is when I was at the foundation, I had um, four billionaires on my board and everyone else was worth more than $100 million, most of them close to half a billion. And the wealthiest director I worked for made rough, we, my CF, CFO and I sat down and said, for the time he's actually sitting at his desk, in his office, doing stuff, not on one of his jets or boats or houses or whatever, what is his hourly wage? And this is back, remember, in 1989, maybe 1990. It was about $800,000 an hour, which I don't know in modern time, but that's probably seven million, several million dollars an hour. And he was one of the most unsuccessful, unhappy people I've ever met. Uh, he had more problems than anyone I knew. We used to, just, used to just say he arrived at them in style, you know, in a Learjet or a limousine or something like that. Now, the other side of the coin, I make this clear, is I had some exceedingly wealthy um, board members who were happy as could be, great family relationships, owned jets and houses and everything. The correlation was not the amount of wealth. The correlation was the values. Mm -hmm. And, and then, which takes me to the third thing. I did a TED talk on this too, which is the most important thing I've ever learned in my life. And this will go back to your youth and the 12 step program and everything. And what I just spoke about is you become what you focus on and like the people you spend time with. If you're focused on negative things, that things that are bad for and you spend time around people that are doing the same things, you get the outcome that you got. Uh, and I, you know, well, I haven't been through the same thing, but you get a negative outcome. Mm. However, if you surround yourself with bright, sharp, smart, talented people with high values and integrity that tell the truth, and you focus on 
living a life of values, um, understanding your relationship with wealth. There is nothing wrong with wealth. Money is really good. A, it allows you to take care of your family and yourself, but B, it allows you to help other people. Um, one of the things I think about accumulating wealth is that it gives you the opportunity to give away wealth and to help people and support people that support your values. So the, as I take away all this, I look back then, I look back now, which is surround yourself with great people and focus on the right things. And even if you lose all your stuff or you make a whole bunch of stuff, it all seems to go on the right path. Yeah. I would add one last thing is that I, I live in an apartment and I'm 50, almost 57. I live in a, 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 a basically a three bedroom apartment. One of them is my office, one of them is my mom's room and one of them is my room here in Bangkok. And it's a simple life. And I kind of made a point of not moving into a bigger place or a big house or something because every year at, at New Year's time, I, I hire some people to help me and we just go through everything in the house and I think I got to reduce by, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% what's here as a way of just keeping myself from getting attached to stuff. And that just makes me free ultimately. So now let me ask you, based upon what you learned from this experience and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Wow, that's a great question. Is to, um, to look at the things that are truly important and valuable in your life. You know, I'll, actually, I'll give you a great example. Do what's called the eulogy exercise. And this is a really, really tough exercise or, or workshop. I teach it in some of the classes I teach is sit down and take about, it's going to take several hours and a couple boxes of tissue, but sit down and say, I want to look at three people at my own funeral. If, if there were three people giving me a eulogy, what would someone from my family say about me? What would from someone from my business, uh, my business community say about me? And what would someone from my regular community or my faith community say about me? And if you sit down and you truly take this seriously and you write down the actual words that you want your family, your friends, your business associates and your community to say about you, guess what is not in there? How big your house was, how many boats you owned, if you had a plane, how many pairs of shoes you had. Those things are all great and they, they're fun and I'm, I'm all for them, but no one's gonna remember that in your life. They're gonna remember, are you a person of honesty, integrity? How much did you love other people? How much did they love you? How much did you give back to the world from, from love and kindness and caring? And as soon as you look at that, you know what you realize? I can do that today. I don't need more money or more stuff. It's again, it's fine. I, you know, you're, you're we're, many of your listeners are here because they want to build wealth. But at the end of the day, it's about relationships and love and integrity. Beautiful. So what's a resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? I will recommend a good friend of mine, Tom Morris, has written several books on this. And I'll, I'll say this interestingly, is I read one of his books when I was younger, just in college. I failed out of college on the first try. My family, who was very, very wealthy, disowned me. Uh, and I had to turn things around. And one of the, and I ended up graduating number three in the United States on the second try. So I was able to turn it around. But there's a book from Tom Morris called True Success that I read that had a profound impact on me. Um, and he's written many other books since then. If I were to point you towards a resource, it would be the books from Tom Morris, especially True Success and the Seven A's of Achievement. Those were life-changing books for me. Fantastic. And I'll put links to that in the show notes. Well, last question. What is your number one goal for the next 12 months? Learn more. Read more, learn more. Um, I, I was thinking the other day, I, I, my birthday again at 58 was just a few weeks ago. And here's what I realized. I know almost nothing about almost everything and a little bit about almost nothing. So, <laughs> Say that three I, times. Yeah, I know. Well, I early in my career, I thought I was really pretty sharp and I would challenge people, even CEOs of huge companies to prove that I was right. One day I woke up, realized I'm not right. I have an opinion, you know, it's, it's fairly thoughtful and well-researched and well-read and I've got a lot of experience. But at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm just kind of making stuff up as I go along. And now at my age, I'm learning the most I ever have. Every day is new and exciting. 
Um, every book I read leaves me to three more. Every person I meet creates, creates larger people in my network. So I'm the most excited I've ever been about learning and growing and expanding and meeting new people. So my goal is learn more, meet more people. Beautiful. I was just thinking that um, going back to what you said earlier about simplicity, uh, life doesn't come with an instruction manual. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It so does keep not. life simple. <laughs> you know, keep life simple. I always say to people, when it gets complicated, go back to simplicity and, yep. and learn more, you know, meet more people, try to, you know, expand yourself. There's a challenge for all of us. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. If you haven't yet taken the risk reduction assessment, I challenge you to go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk. As we conclude, John, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Just uh, live by your values, treat other people with love, and have fun. We'll just leave it at that. Beautiful. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Thank you for joining our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.